second interview in the series of the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law at Monash University uh, in Melbourne, Australia, entitled Human Rights Leaders in Conversation. I am Professor Kevin Bell, the Director of the Centre. Uh, in this series, I engage in conversation with leaders in human rights in Australia and the world about issues of importance in this field of ever-growing importance. As is customary in Australia, where First, Nation peoples, First Nations peoples uh, have lived and do live uh, under the, their sovereign law for over 60,000 years, the oldest continuing cultures on earth, I pay my respects to them as the, as the traditional owners of the land from which I speak my words and the other lands to which my words will go, and to their elders past and presence. The traditional owners of the land from which I speak are the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and I especially acknowledge their elders past and present. It is my singular privilege uh, today to welcome Judge Robert Spano, the President of the European Court of Human Rights, as my guest in this interview. As you may know, I was a Justice of the, uh, Justice of, of the Supreme Court of Victoria for 15 years until taking up my present position as Director of the Centre. Uh, in that capacity, uh, and as President of the Victorian Civil and Administrative Appeals Tribunal, I decided many cases uh, under Victoria's new Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act, which is similar to the European Convention on Human Rights under which Judge, Judge, Spano's, court operate, Judge Spano's court operates. That convention is the oldest comprehensive binding rights, human rights instrument in the world. And it is no uh, exaggeration uh, to say uh, that it was my uh, true guide uh, during uh, my period of judicial office uh, in which I was deciding cases under the charter. It came into force in 1950 and is having its 70th anniversary this year. Because the uh, convention was so important to me in my judicial work, it is a very special pleasure to me to have the current president uh, of the European Court of Human Rights as a leader in conversation with me today. Judge Sparno was born in Reykjavik, Iceland in 1972. He graduated in arts and law from the University of Iceland in 1997 and took a master's in European and comparative law at the University of Oxford in 2000, winning two prizes. Judge Spano was a district court judge in Iceland and then a professor of law at the University of Iceland where he served among other things as the Dean of Law before being appointed to the European Court of Human Rights in 2013. He was the parliamentary ombudsman for Iceland. Judge Spano served as a section president at the court from 2017 to 2019, as vice president from 2019 to this year, and as president from the 18th of May this year until his nine year judicial term ends in 2022. Judge Spano is a renowned legal scholar and especially well placed to speak on the main themes of our conversation today the 70th anniversary of the European Convention on Human Rights, the significance of that convention, the evolution of the court uh, and its function and the challenges that it faces in the contemporary world. Thank you very much for attending today, Judge Spano. Judge Spano, we- Thank share you very much, some... Justice Bell. Thank you. We share something, uh, but the thing is very different. We were both born on islands, as it happens, you in Iceland and me on Australia. Uh, but of course, ours is a continent, yours is a, a big island. Uh, and the reason I raise this is that I have heard you describe yourself as a Nordic judge. And I'm very interested to know, just at the personal level, uh, what has been the significance of your Nordic island upbringing, both to you as a person and to you as a judge. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to be a part of your uh, series and this interesting conversation on, on important issues. That's a very interesting question. Um, well, first of all, I think uh, it is there is something to the fact uh, of having been born 
uh, and brought up for most of my life, not all of my life, as I can explain, because my father is Italian, so uh, I did live abroad for a while, uh, but most of my life in Iceland. And I think the most important aspect of that is being brought up in small communities uh, has a certain uh, effect on the way you perceive a community. It, there is a lot of closeness. There is a lot of uh, idea of solidarity. Oh. I come from a country which is, as you know, in the North Atlantic, which had to fight for survival for, for centuries, uh, for its independence. And I think that has imbued in me uh, 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 as a, a, a sort of an ideal of rigor, independence, the ability to, to experience adversity and willingness to fight for one's ideals. Uh, when it comes to my legal experience, I think, uh, well, the Nordic tradition in law is, is, I think, an interesting one. It is jurisprudentially quite disciplined. Um, for example, I think Nordic judges are known for their legal pragmatism, their realism, uh, I, you, you would rarely see a Nordic judge being extremely creative or mm -hmm. idealistic mm -hmm. uh, in a sense of imagining, for example, judges straying very far away from the text or the original meaning and, and issues of that sort, uh, where you can see that being more uh, of an open facet mm -hmm. in, in other traditions. So sort of to sum up, I think those those perhaps have been uh, my experiences. Thank you. I can uh, vividly remember my first consciousness uh, of uh, a human right. Uh, it was at Monash University uh, where I studied law uh, in about the mid seventies. And the right was the right to adequate housing. And I guess uh, the, uh, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights coming into force in 1976, if I'm not mistaken, it was probably by reason of that that I remember this. Uh, until then, I had no consciousness of, uh, of the idea of a, of a human right. Uh, and it was some time later that I, I became conscious of its, of its importance and its democratic power and its emancip emancipatory uh, quality. I'm interested to know when you first were, became conscious of the idea of a human right. And I, of course, I'm aware that the convention came into force uh, in 1950, so that the history of uh, human rights in Europe, of which Iceland's a part, uh, is much earlier. Can you tell me, do you remember when you first had this idea of, a, of, a, of this thing called a human rights in your mind? And tell me about the context. I think I think there, uh, of course, there is one difference between you and me, Justice Bell. Is yes. I'm a bit younger, so yes. I, I am maybe the the a younger generation. So when yes. I started law school in 1992, um, uh, human rights as a legal discipline was already quite, I wouldn't say developed, but was mm -hmm. was quite. Uh, uh, influential already in Icelandic legal circles mm. for historical reasons. We, we, uh, we were, of course, a one of the founding members of the Council of Europe. Uh, we, had been, we had ratified or signed the European Convention on Human Rights already in 1950. So it, it, it was already a part of our legal culture to a certain extent. But if you ask me at a more personal level, mm. I think quite early, the reason mm. being that, as I mentioned, my father is an immigrant. He came to Iceland in 1970 from Italy. And uh, in those times, when I was a very young child, uh, being the son of an immigrant, even in a country like Iceland, which is rather progressive and, and democratically oriented, uh, there were prejudices and there were issues that arose uh, during my childhood. For example, my father could not retain his family name. So he had to change his name into a name which uh, conformed to Icelandic rules of naming. So that I remember very early for me constituted a, a rights issue. Now, whether well, I actually well, formulated it as well, a rights issue or a human yes. rights issue, I'm not sure, but I, I really sensed that it was an issue of justice. 
so well, the I court can is, see uh, that the, the court, court has more than been, once the court has more than once passed on the uh, on the privacy indeed, issue involved in uh, the concept indeed, of a name. Uh, so you, you're on strong ground there, I guess. Yes. Can I ask you? Did you study human rights at primary school or at secondary school? I studied law in secondary school. So yes. when I was when I was about seventeen or eighteen in secondary school before starting university, there was a course on law in mm. my secondary school, which I took, which dealt with constitutional rights to a certain extent, sort of the constitutional framework of the country, separation of powers. Yes, and some elements of human rights. This must have been uh, 1990, 1989, 1990. Mm. Mm. I have a specific reason for asking these questions. The, the Caston Centre uh, has a, a strong commitment to uh, human rights education at, at all levels, and some of our academics have published important books on the subject. Uh, and I'm interested to know um, your thoughts about just how well understood human rights are in the general population in Europe. I can well imagine that there'll be big variations between uh, countries and between regions of countries, and it's hard to speak generally. But would you would you say, um, uh, are you able to offer a view as to whether human rights are well understood uh, or not? I think, I think, I mean, that is an extremely important question. Mm. Um, I, I, my answer would be, I think the, the words human rights are words which are well known to most uh, most of, of 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 at least informed individuals in Europe. Mm. Now the question is: You prefaced your question with, "Are they well understood?" Yes. I mean, that I think is to some extent a bit problematic. Yes. At least now in Europe, human rights have been and have developed almost into a catch term for, yes. I would say, uh, or used by populist politicians as a pejorative or a negative mm. kind of term, mm. because it is associated with uh, criminals, terrorists, their yeah. rights, and so forth, mm. but not sort of the underlying value system, which was the basis or the origins of the international human rights movement. Mm. So I think human rights are, are, are well known, mm. but whether they are well understood is a challenge. And I think that is one of the challenges we are facing mm. those in the human rights community that really want to advocate the correct understanding of these concepts. Yes. Uh if we're right about this, that human rights are, uh, are known but not understood, might be a way to put it, uh, at least not well understood, yeah. uh, even perhaps misunderstood, uh, then um, yeah. public education about human rights is uh, a fundamental part of the solution. I I is that important? Is there, much, is there much in Europe or, or, or not? I think now I, I'm going to be careful because, of course, I'm not aware of, of, you know, general curricula at primary or secondary school. Certainly, human rights law is extremely prevalent in Europe, and I, I think I can say that in all of the Council of Europe member states, the 47 European states which form the Council of Europe, human rights law has become an integral part of law faculty discipline. Mm. No, but I do think there, there should be at the level of earlier education, mm. uh, pri even primary school education, mm. there are certainly, uh, uh, there certainly should be more done in immediately at the earlier stages of children's education to start to talk about human rights fundamental values of society and so forth. Uh, and, and I think if I take my own country, Iceland, I think I can safely say that that is lacking to some extent when it comes to primary and secondary schooling. Uh, uh, and I think it should start very early. But of course, at the end of the day, uh, I always say human rights, if correctly understood, are really very much close to what we can, we can say are fundamental human values yes. associated with dignity, autonomy, 
uh, a re mutual respect. respect. And of course, that starts in the home. Yeah. It starts in the home. It starts with upbringing. It starts with parental guidance uh, and so forth. Let's move to the convention now. Um, it's an important year this year, the 70th um, anniversary. The court has been very active. Uh, if uh, you will permit me to congratulate you on the material that's available on your website. Uh, there is some excellent material Thank I can say much. to those listening um, on the significance of the convention, uh, the way that uh, it underpins the work of your court, uh, its importance to European society and so on, all very well covered. Uh, but uh, uh, coming to the court, uh, the court itself, if I'm not mistaken, was established in 1959 uh, and did not work full time uh, until 1998, again, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, also, when it was first established, uh, the, um, the parties' applications to the court could be brought by states, but not individuals. Uh, and I think it was again in 1998 that individual applications could be made under Protocol 11. How would you describe um, the various phases of the court's uh, development? Uh, and if it's not too large a question, uh, I wonder if you could comment upon the um, the the, the uh, historical and social forces which moulded the court uh, and uh, and brought about the various phases of its development since it was established uh, up until now. I think I think it is useful to uh, develop that question uh, question with 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 formulating the phases as being fourfold. Yes, there was a first phase from about 1959 to approximately 1973-74, uh, which is often called the diplomatic phase, because then the court, as you mentioned, was a relatively unknown in institution. Its relevance in the European legal space was limited. There were not many member states were a part of the convention. Uh, it was a very Western European entity. It was created after the Second World War. Uh, and I think many states that uh, started off and originated uh, the establishment of the court in January 1959 considered that the court would be, you know, very symbolic. It wouldn't really have an impact or intrude into national sovereignty. So the cases dealt with from 1959 to about 1973-74 were few and far between. And they, they, although dealing with important issues, they were, they were not of great significance for the overall development of the system. The second phase is a phase which starts, as I mentioned, 73, 74, up until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. This is usually and has been called the judicial phase. This is when the court really becomes a court. And I think the reason for that is quite simple. It is the, the increase of multilateralism, the increase of internationalism in law, mm. the acceptance of international institutions being a part of a progressive, integrative uh, international environment. You know, we have the European communities, as uh, now I'm talking about the European Union today, becoming a very strong force in European politics and integration. So there was an openness for an international court to be quite active. So all of the seminal judgments of the court on, on the living instrument doctrine, on yeah. uh, the principle of subsidiarity or the margin of appreciation, mm. they are rendered during this judicial phase from about 74 to 89. Mm. 1989, the, the third phase starts, which is the, the phase uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the expansion of the Council of Europe to the east and where we have many, many member states uh, transitioning to democracy from uh, a, a post-communist rule, which become member states of the Council of Europe. And that had a, a significant impact on the convention system, culminating in uh, Protocol 11, establishing the permanent court in 1998. And then we see in the beginning of the new millennia, uh, fl the, uh, the floodgates of cases coming to the court, mainly from these Eastern European countries. Mm. In 2010, we can say that the fourth and current phase commences, and then we have intergovernmental declarations and conferences trying to grapple with the backlog of cases and Protocol 14 
coming yeah. into force mm. in mid 2010, which had a great impact on the reform of the court towards its being able to deal with more and more cases at a, in an expedited manner. Yes. Uh, so that phase is the phase we are currently in, mm -hmm. but I think we, we will be soon moving into a, what I would call the fifth phase, which is a phase where we will, we're going back to first principles, mm -hmm. rule of law, judicial independence is going to be at the forefront in the coming years. Yes. Could you develop on that, please? Well, I think what we have seen uh, in the last 10 to 15 years is unfortunately quite uh, a detrimental backlash in many European states vis-a-vis -vis the concept of international institutions uh, being able to pronounce judgments or opinions about national issues. So in other words, multilateralism and internationalism has taken a beating. But secondly, I think the concept of human rights has become somewhat problematic at the national political level. Yes. And, and that has had an impact in many member states of, uh, let's say, a retrogressive view about the realization of human rights. That has had an impact on the separation of powers. Mm -hmm. That has had an impact on judicial independence. Mm -hmm. That has had an impact on the way the rule of law is understood. Mm -hmm. And we see more and more cases in the court where we are grappling with these fundamental core principles mm. of any democratic society governed by the rule of law, mm. which are now becoming more and more prevalent in the case law. And I think that is what I mean by us moving towards, I don't wanna use the word a defensive posture, but again, I think we are moving towards a situation where the courts, both national courts implementing the convention Mm. and the European Court of Human Rights have to be extremely rigorous yes. and robust mm. in enforcing uh, the fundamental principles of democracy, rule of law, mm. and human rights. It's, uh, it's impossible to divorce uh, the, um, the uh, what you might, what some have called the, the backlash against human rights. Uh, I don't myself, but I've, I, I think you know what I mean, from populism. Uh, yeah. We have uh, the phenomena of, um, of, of strong leaders, almost all, uh, always men, um, countries like Poland, Hungary, Turkey, uh, there are others uh, who are uh, responding, uh, if, not, uh, if not generating, certainly maintaining um, a, a, a nationalist, localized, small view of the world, um, certainly not multilateral, uh, usually stridently um, anti-European institutions, uh, is uh, I've seen it argued uh, that um, by some that human rights is part of the problem in this regard uh, that uh, that human rights hasn't hasn't been seen by people who need them most actually to be meaningful to them and somehow to them to be part of the problem. Um, what's your reaction to that sort of criticism of human rights? I think it is important for us that have uh, decided to make human rights as a concept and as a value system part of what we live for and fight for. Mm. I think it is important for us not to underestimate the nature of that criticism. The, and, and I've said this before publicly, I think the international human rights movement, and I think international courts and national human rights litigators and judges should realize that there is a limit to the extent to which human rights can be imposed from top to bottom. Yes. In other words, you and me, Justice Bell, we are part of, uh, an, uh, uh, let's, let's be frank, we are part of a human rights elite Yes. We are intellectuals who have uh, in, ed, ed, been educated in this field. We have mm. been judges. Mm. In the, at the end of the day, for human rights to be ultimately sustainable and successful, they need to be experienced in the hearts and minds of peoples, people at the grassroots level. Everyday people have to realize what are the benefits of human rights and what 
they really mean for their lives every day. And that I think is now uh, the project moving forward. It is to it is to bring human rights down from abstract theory mm. and bring it to the level of the, the, the everyday person who can understand that the value system that the, that human rights are is based on is actually uh, uh, the, the only way for us to have a meaningful, stable, and prosperous society and a community of peoples. Mm. Uh, so I think we are now have to move to a more proactive, more progressive. Uh, educational uh, uh, development in this field, yes. because there is simply so much that courts can do. There is just so much that litigation can do. Can do. There is mm. just so much that human rights activism can do. Mm. It's really we have to persuade all peoples mm. that this is a value system worth fighting for. Of course, you're you're famous for using the word substantial embedding to describe a particular phase of the of your court's work. Uh, this conversation makes me think it's almost as if we need to go uh, through a substantial embedding phase at the community level with respect to human rights. Yes, I agree with that. I think uh, I think that must be what we aim for. Uh, I mean, we started off talking about education at the primary school level. Hmm. I think we, we must move from uh, the idea that human rights is a discipline limited to uh, a particular group of specialists and experts yes. who are interacting with each other. Although, let's be frank, it is it is has been an extremely important mm. movement, and mm. it, and and it is something we should be proud of. Mm. But we have to realize that now we have to take an, an, a further step. Mm. to meaningfully integrate mm. human rights as a, 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 as, as a way of life which resonates with all peoples mm. and not just as, as sort of a theoretical exercise, yes. which where, where there is a clash between experts at the legal and the political level. As, um, as a former judge, speaking to the president of, uh, of the European Court of Human Rights, I must ask a, a question about judges. Uh, I am concerned um, about the, uh, the human rights of judges, especially uh, because of um, reports about them suffering uh, reprisals for being independents. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, uh, Mr. Diego Garcia, uh, uh, Diane has um, raised particular concerns about the uh, treatment of judges in, uh, in some countries, uh, dismissals, um, disguised reprisals, all sorts of things of that kind. Can I ask, uh, has your court um, experience of judges relying upon their own human rights uh, in applications personally to the court arising out of uh, treatment by them, which is inconsistent with the judicial nature of their office uh, and the independence yes. which it involves? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we have rendered in the past seven or eight years, a number of very important judgments mm. uh, at the grand chamber level, mm. which deal with applications brought by judges themselves Probably the most famous case is the case of Baca versus Hungary, yes. which deals with the dismissal of the former president of the Hungarian Supreme Court uh, based on a constitutional amendment. This was a judgment we rendered a few years ago. That was a judgment based on a finding of a violation of his freedom of expression because it was found by the court that it was his expressive activity as president of the Supreme Court, which had been the basis for his dismissal. There was also a question there of access to court. We have had other cases. We have a Portuguese grand chamber judgment dealing with disciplinary uh, uh, measures taken against sitting judges. Uh, we have uh, cases at the chamber level in relation to the detention of judges in Turkey, where we have found very strong violations yes. uh, based, on, based on measures taken which have not been uh, lawful under yes. Article 5 
-hmm. of the convention. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly a field which I just mentioned before, which has which has been of great concern. Yes. And the court has already dealt with a number of cases where the principles of judicial independence and the separation of powers have been at the forefront mm -hmm. of our judgments. Yes, thank you. Could I, could I ask you uh, about uh, the, uh, the uh, what I might call human rights uh, adjudication uh, as a specialized form of judging? Uh, and I, I, I don't ask you this question with any, uh, with any presumption about what your answer might be, but I'm very interested in it. Uh, the reason is that uh, having been a judge uh, and wanting to uh, develop uh, this kind of judging further, uh, I'll be, uh, I've designed and will be teaching a course next year on human rights adjudication. And I'm, I'm looking at this question of whether uh, human rights judging um, is uh, different to other kinds of judging, uh, such that it is worth uh, exploring um, how a judge can uh, human rights judge better, uh, as it were. Have you reflected on whether human rights judging is the same as or different to uh, other kinds of judging? Uh, have you uh, wondered what's similar uh, between ordinary judging, as it were, and uh, human rights judging, and what's different? And um, what's your answer to the uh, to the question? Is uh, human rights adjudication uh, different to other kinds? I think I think the answer to that uh, is, in my view, twofold. Yes, uh, I mean, I am the president of the European Court of Human Rights. I've been a human rights judge for many years. I was, of course, an ombudsman before that, which is basically a human rights uh, uh, advisory body or a, a, an opinion making body at national level. So human rights has been my discipline for two decades. Yes, uh, my answer is, is human rights adjudication different? Yes and no. Let yes. me explain. Yes, I think one should one should first say it is not different from any other form of adjudication in the sense that a judge is is defining and formulating the state of the law yes. as it is at the time that a judgment is rendered. Mm -hmm. I think it is dangerous to define human rights adjudication as being different from regular forms of adjudication in that particular sense. Yes. Because we do not want to give critics tools to undermine the legitimacy of human rights judgments as being law, as being a, a discipline of adjudication which has the same legitimacy as any other types of adjudication. But the answer to your question is also yes. Human rights adjudication is different in the sense of the methodology of assessment mm -hmm. as being to some extent very special. Mm -hmm. Human rights adjudication by its very nature is an assessment of often clashing value systems mm -hmm. or, or the assessment of balance between clashing principles. The text of the law, the text of the law, whilst important, is not and can never be as determinative mm. in human rights adjudication as in other forms of adjudication, simply because human rights provisions are inevitably couched in broad statements of principle. So that means that when one enters into the adjudicatory process in human rights cases, one has to proceed on the basis that there are certain, there is a certain regime that you have entered, which requires discipline in assessing the different values and principles that one is dealing with. And I also do think that differently from other types of adjudication, structural principles principles of institutional prerogatives, mm -hmm. the, the, the place of the judge in a system of governance under the rule of law, mm -hmm. the place of the judge within a democratic society becomes ever more important because it can be there within the assessment of the institutional place of the judge where actually the solution to a human rights question becomes A or B. 
because it is often a question of deference. It's often a question of to what extent will I defer to decision making taken by other branches of government, which uh, is very special to human rights adjudication, both at the international level and also at the national level, while you're dealing with constitutional norms of Bill of Rights or the Victorian Charter that you mentioned, where you are inevitably in that situation of having to determine the institutional place of the different branches of government. It, uh, it, it seems to me that, that growing up in a system uh, in which uh, values and interests uh, are the language of adjudication uh, is a great advantage by comparison with a system where it's not. And uh, if we look at uh, some common law countries uh, with um, quite rigid separation of powers and legal principles being defined in black letter terms uh, and being seen to be different to values and interests, uh, judges don't uh, necessarily articulate the issues uh, in a way that embraces those values and interests. I'm interested to know uh, whether the, there's a kind of European acceptance of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the validity and legitimacy of judges talking about values and interests uh, as a necessary part of human rights adjudication, um, or uh, whether there are uh, there is still some criticism of, uh, of judges doing that uh, in a way that is value-laden and non-judicial. I, I, think, I think there has always been a, a, a tension. Uh, I, would, I would not allow myself to use the words European acceptance. I mean, that, no. that is, mm. it's a very broad, Too broad. statement if I would yes. accept it. Mm. I think there has always been and probably always will be a tension between uh, two different views of the judicial function mm. in cases dealing with fundamental rights. And we often use, I mean, the words judicial activism and restraint are used, uh, living interpretive technologies or methodologies vis-a-vis -vis static or originalist or intentional type methodologies, these branches of debate, they all revol revolve around exactly that. There are There is always a tension between the idea that judges can enter into a field using value-laden language, which mm. politicians will accuse judges of entering the policy arena on the one hand, and those that believe that in a society governed by the rule of law yes. and, and fundamental rights being legal norms, mm. there needs to be an adjudicator to give life to these norms. Who is sensitive to their and it, nature. Yeah, and, and so I think that's that has always been the case. What I would say is, I think this tension has become more acute yes. in recent years mm. uh, in Europe. Uh, and I think not only in Europe, in, no. in many parts, we, we see the debate in the US. It's, it's, uh, the, same in, it's where, the same in Australia. It's the same in Australia. Mm. And I think it is, it is a clash. It is, it is a power clash mm. uh, in, to some extent. And, mm. and so I do think judges have to be mindful of, of this tension, but uh, they mustn't shy away from doing their duty. I mean, mm. the judges have a duty to apply the law and so long as human rights norms are a part of the law and norms they are to, to apply, it requires them to take a position. Mm. And, and, uh, and that is what we do in the European Court of Human Rights every day. And pressure put on the court by politicians has no impact on our work. No. It's as simple as that. Mm. Uh, Judge Spano, uh, the next question I ask you, I ask you because of the influence uh, upon me of a particular uh, associate who was doing research uh, in the area of uh, sexual orientation and gender, gender identity, um, uh, supervised, I might say, by uh, an academic at, uh, at the Kasten Center, whom I very much respect. Uh, and it, the, the, uh, the debate between uh, this associate and I was uh, very much about the, uh, the relevance of the right to privacy and associated rights 
uh, to, um, to protecting a uh, person's sexual orientation and gender identity uh, in a way uh, which isn't, pro isn't protected by other rights. And I'm familiar with the very considerable body of jurisprudence which your court has developed uh, to embrace and to protect um, and to respect and to validate uh, different forms of, uh, of sexual expression and identity. Uh, but my associate would say, no, 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 none of that. Uh, equality is the only right on which to build uh, true uh, protection and respect. Uh, privacy is a right, uh, implies that uh, people with minority uh, sexual orientation and gender identity interests uh, can do that on their own underground, but uh, not uh, uh, along with uh, the rest of us. W what is your response to um, this debate? How effective do you think the court has been uh, in, uh, in protecting and recognising uh, minor minority interests of this kind uh, by comparison with uh, how it might have been done, perhaps is being done uh, under the equality right. It's a very interesting question. Uh, as you mentioned, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in this field is vast. Um, I think I can safely say that there is no court in the world mm -hmm. that has been as pioneering when it comes to LGBTI rights than the European Court of Human Rights. This began in the 1970s and 80s mm -hmm. with famous judgments uh, in relation to uh, uh, homosexuality. Uh, and we have moved far along with requirements of legal recognition of same-sex relationships uh, and so forth. It is true that that has mainly been done under the right to family life and the right to private life under Article 8 of the Convention. Mm -hmm. Now, I would disagree with your associate if the idea is that protection under Article 8 is protection which is limited to one's uh, inner circle or let's say a social or non-social or public yes. identity. Yes. Mm. I think I think that is I think that is incorrect. I think the idea with our jurisprudence, in particular the positive obligations under Article 8, is exactly to create a framework in which sexual orientation, uh, sexual identity is not uh, used as a limitation on the full enjoyment of these rights under Article 8. Now, we do not have a general equality clause no. under, under the convention, as you are aware. We have no. Article 14, which is a principle against uh, discrimination. It's a ban uh, on, on discrimination, but only in relation to those rights which are in the convention itself. So no. it, is, it, is, it is a provision which requires a showing that one of the rights in under the convention, the right to privacy, for example, is implicated and the measures then taken by the government cannot discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation under Article 14. So we, we also do have an emerging equality based jurisprudence under yes. the convention, mm -hmm. so as to give further support to this idea that the underlying core feature of this jurisprudence is the recognition of human dignity, personal autonomy. Oh. And, and it is clear when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity, the court's current position is we are talking about core yes. fundamental, fundamental human rights, yes. which, which oh. lie, very, lie very much at the innermost sanctum of uh, the rights and freedoms guaranteed by the convention. Now, this, of course, is, I think, one of the big successes of the convention system and one in which we in the court are particularly proud of. Uh, in the time available, uh, let's talk about uh, the, uh, the challenges that the uh, court uh, will be confronting. Uh, I want to get uh, one out of the way. Um, people will be interested to know whether you think that uh, Brexit is going to be uh, presenting any challenge to the court. Of course, it's from the EU and not the Council of Europe uh, and the, uh, the convention remains. Uh, are you in a position to offer any view about uh, the implications of, Bre of Brexit for the court? No, I think I would, I would, I would ask not to comment yes. directly, only to say that 
Well, as at the formal level, Brexit has no impact on the court, yes. simply because the United Kingdom remains in the Council of Europe. Uh, these are two different entities. Yes. Uh, the United Kingdom is a proud founding member of the Council of Europe. It's a very important uh, member state. And, and so at the formal level, it, it has no impact on our work. Mm. Now, one can theorize about possible impacts, but I, I would leave it for, for commentators yes. to, to comment rather than myself. Thank you. Now, we, uh, we're, we're living in a world, uh, and in your host country is this uh, nowhere more unfortunately evident, um, where the pandemic is impacting uh, upon all of our lives, upon uh, governmental institutions, uh, including courts. Uh, I know that your court has had to deal with this um, in, at a practical level, and uh, I would think that the, human, the many human rights implications of government responses to the pandemic will start unfolding in your court if they have not already. Uh, could you comment on the, uh, the challenges that uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic holds for human rights and your court in particular? I think that the starting point there uh, it must be a realization that uh, the pandemic is not just a health crisis. It is a crisis for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law as well. I have told my colleagues and the staff at the court, uh, we may not be healthcare providers, but we are at the front line of tackling the, the effects of the pandemic at uh, uh, the jurisprudential level, at the level of governance mm -hmm. and human rights. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, of course, have to realize that the European court, there is a bit of a time lag when it comes to the consequences of the pandemic, because under the convention, cases have to first be generated and decided at the national level before they come to the Strasbourg court. So we are not as yet, we, ha we, we haven't received direct pandemic related applications, which we can decide on the merits but we have received a multitude of requests for what we call interim measures yes. under Rule 39 of the Rules of Court, which deal with, for example, uh, prison conditions of persons uh, mm. with the coronavirus and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, internally, the pandemic has had a great impact. I mean, mm. we, like yourself, we have been secluded and confined for two periods in France. We decided immediately in March, I was then one of the two vice presidents, that we would do everything in our power to keep things rolling, to keep productivity up. We held video conferenced grand chamber hearings in June, the first of their kind for us, and, and they went extremely well. So we have used information technology very proficiently to keep things going. But to sum up, the pandemic brings us back to first principles. Mm. It demonstrates mm. the importance of human rights. Mm. It demonstrates the importance of family, mm. of solidarity, mm. of the fact that we are all uh, the global population, all human beings, mm. transcending borders, transcending politics. We are all in the same situation. We're all in this together. Mm. And my hope is, if I am allowed to take off my judicial robe for 30 seconds, my hope is that we realize the how the pandemic demonstrates the importance of multilateralism, the importance of working together across boundaries, across geographies, across borders, because that is the only way for us to be able to deal with an issue like this. And that goes also to the question of governance, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. This is not a period where governments can use governmental powers to disproportionately uh, uh, abuse or uh, uh, violate human rights for political ends. That is something human rights judges cannot tolerate and must be very vigorous in defending principles of legality, proportionality, lack of, of, of executive discretion that is overly vague and broad. And finally, that states of emergencies are not used to normalize uh, uh, emergency measures, which should only be in place uh, when actual emergencies are, are unfolding. 
Judge Robert Spano, you've been um, talking with me uh, as a part of the uh, Caston Centre for Human Rights Law, Human Rights Leaders in Conversation series. Uh, it's been uh, my uh, enormous uh, honour uh, to be interviewing you. Uh, you are the President of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, you are in a working day uh, and uh, have a busy day ahead of you, uh, which uh, I mention only to underline how grateful uh, I am uh, for making yourself available uh, to this interview. Uh, to all of you who have been to all of you who have been watching, um, uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, in the usual way, uh, this interview will be published on the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law website within the next day or two. Uh, um, uh, and I guess uh, 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 it remains only for me to say thank you uh, and goodbye.